that. era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Cross Talk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3. Coming up this afternoon, Rishi's election threat. The Prime Minister tells rebel MPs he'd rather call an election than face a leadership campaign. Meanwhile, is Kate about to open up? Reports suggest the Princess of Wales could discuss her health with well wishes. And the V&A under fire as a new exhibit places Margaret Thatcher alongside Hitler and Osama <laughs> Bin Laden. Yep, you heard that right. <laughs> All of that is coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Elliot Gotkin. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak has dismissed speculation of a plot to replace him to avoid a general election disaster, insisting his party is united. Sources say Conservative MPs are considering replacing him with Penny Mordaunt if Sunak is unable to turn around the Tories' opinion poll deficit. The Prime Minister said the speculation doesn't matter. I'm not interested in all Westminster politics. It doesn't matter. What matters is the future of our country. And that's what I'm squarely focused on. That's what I get up every morning working as hard as I can to deliver, whether it's cutting people's taxes, increasing the state pension, today increasing the number of apprenticeships and talking to small businesses. Those are the other things that matter to people. Vladimir Putin has claimed a landslide win in Russia's election, extending his rule as president for another six years. Early results last night claimed the leader, who has ruled for nearly a quarter of a century, won nearly 88 per cent of the vote. However, no credible opposition candidate was allowed to stand. Putin hailed his win as an indication of trust and hope in him. Former National Security Advisor Lord Kim Darroch told Talk TV it's about how Putin is seen on the world stage. And of course, we are all saying in the West it was a sham election, as it was. What happened to Navalny shows what happens if you're a serious opponent of Vladimir Putin. But in the rest of the world, they may see things, see things a little differently. And what it means he can do is he can go on the international stage and say, first of all, I have complete support from the Russian population, or near complete support. Second, this was an endorsement of what I am doing in Ukraine. Media regulator Ofcom has found GB News broke broadcasting rules in five programmes hosted by serving Tory MPs. They involve episodes from Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg's show and a programme fronted by Esther McVeigh and Philip Davies. Under Ofcom rules, politicians aren't normally allowed to host news programmes. However, they are allowed to present current affairs shows. Detectives have marked the 15th anniversary of the disappearance of university chef Claudia Lawrence with a plea for those with information to come forward. The 35-year-old was reported missing after she failed to turn up for work at York University in March 2009. Her disappearance has been treated as a murder and the case has become one of the best-known unsolved crimes of the past 20 years. Police insist they haven't closed their investigation. I'm fully aware of the complexities that exist in this inquiry, which sadly we have to treat as, as one of suspected murder. However, the single barrier to unlocking the answers for Claudia's loved ones and bringing those responsible for her disappearance to justice remains the same in my view, and that's silence. Britain's most successful female Olympian, Dame Laura Kenny, has announced her retirement from cycling. The 31-year-old won five Olympic golds and seven world championships. She gave birth to her second son last July and says she now won't compete at this year's Paris Olympics. And street artist Banksy has confirmed he is behind a new artwork that appeared overnight in Finsbury Park in North London. The work, which shows a mass of green painted behind a cut-back tree to look like foliage, has a stencil of a person holding a pressure hose next to it. The artist revealed he was responsible on Instagram. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
Hello, it's a sunny afternoon for the vast majority of the UK and largely dry and mild as well. But there are some showers spreading eastwards, mainly across eastern parts of the UK for this afternoon. And before the end of the day, wet and windy weather will be heading towards parts of Northern Ireland and western parts of Britain. But in between all of that, for most of Scotland, England and Wales, it's sunny, it's mainly dry, bar the showers in the east, and it's feeling warm. Warm for the time of year, where temperature highs are locally up to 17 to 18 degrees Celsius, the average for this time of the year is around 11. Now, overnight, we'll continue to see that rain across uh, Northern Ireland spread towards parts of Scotland, Northern and Western England and Wales. It will be windy with it as well and there'll be more wet weather heading across Northern Ireland through the night as well. But it looks like for eastern and southeastern parts of England, it will just about stay dry and everywhere will have a mild night with temperatures holding up in double figures. So tomorrow, once again, it will stay mild, but it's going to be a bit of a wetter day, especially across England and Wales. We'll see spells of rain turning into showers spreading southeast but skies will brighten across many areas. So in the sunshine and the southerly winds, it's still going to be another mild day. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next two hours, including Trump's threat of an economic bloodbath if he loses the election. And we'll ask, is TV still funny? Other than us, of course. Yeah. We're hilarious. Yeah, we're funny, but we're, not we're necessarily brilliant. in a good way. <laughs> uh, but today we are joined in the studio by political commentator Reem Ibrahim. Thank you for joining us on this very, very busy day. Uh, we've got lots coming up, uh, but uh, let's discuss now uh, the latest... Uh, What's your classification for Meghan? Uh, uh, a uh, royal author says that she's just like Wallace Sim Simpson, uh, very manipulative, very controlling. Uh, do you think that's uh, a fair description of, uh, of Meghan, uh, Alex? Look, I don't know Meghan personally, right? And uh, without sounding like a woke Me Too movement social justice warrior, I don't know her. So maybe this is just a huge pile on through a misogynistic lens. But she seems like a bit of a nutter, doesn't she? <laughs> Let's be fair. <laughs> she seems pretty narcissistic and constantly in acting mode. But who do I know? I, you know, I don't know the woman. But yeah. the fact that, you know, if you're in a relationship with someone, moving them to the other side of the world, enabling them to cut off all ties with their old life, their past, their family. If you love someone in a relationship, you're the one trying to build bridges. You're the one saying, do you think you should do that? And the fact that she sat there within that Oprah interview, you know, looking mm -hmm. like she was the deer in the headlights going, oh, people will wave this towards me. Mm. I'm like, come on, if you love the man, really, and if you want to build bridges, you don't go to one of the biggest news anchors in America, mm. so chat show hosts, and sit down and start slagging off his family. So, you know, just on empirical evidence, let's say, I think she's an unpleasant think. person. What I think, Reem, uh, is that uh, last Thursday, was it, when the two brothers were about, about to participate in the Diana awards, mm. the memorial awards for their beloved mother, albeit in a very separate way, William in London, ha Harry down the line from California. Those two can't even bear to be in the same, same room, room, even if one of them is on Zoom. I mean, it seriously mm. is that bad. But it is still the, the only vague connection those two brothers have got is they are united in their devotion to their mother's memory. Uh, good for them. Uh, and and uh, here's the Diana. But, you know, so what did she do on that very day? She announces this big banner announcement. Here comes my new lifestyle website. And I want you to give me lots and lots of Beige money. Maple it's called uh, so yeah, Amer American, uh, what was it called? American Riviera Orchard. Uh, the timing of that announcement mm. was frankly ruthless and nasty. No, I completely agree. And actually, I think that she probably just didn't think it through because she's so her, prepared. Yeah. She thought it through. No, <laughs> Absolutely so. thought it I through. Think her, no, she no, is the no, no. Not even that room. That's no, not true. I think it's She knows true. exactly. You're she saying, really you're saying she did that by accident. Yeah. I, I think she's so in her own world and so narcissistic. And I think Alex is you right. You think we she don't know did that personally. by accident? I don't think she oh, did it on purpose. On. No, come I don't on. think she thought... Well, she didn't no. notice that Harry was going to be doing a Zoom link <laughs> later on no, to the Diana Awards. She I didn't don't notice think, that. I don't think she She knew thought, exactly what she no, was doing. Kevin, no, Kevin. No, no, look, no, no, I no, think... No, trust me, I'm older than you. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm considerably older than you. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I think she probably didn't think about it. And actually, she's so narcissistic. All of you, her entire life, the launching of her lifestyle yeah. website, the launching of her own career, the fact that she's taken her husband away from his family, mm. and they're not just any family, yeah. the other royal family, taken them away. And actually, I think that she just doesn't think for, for want about anybody else but well, herself. I think, oh, I think narcissism is usually someone who is quite controlling and very yes. deliberate about yeah. their actions. Mm. It's a form of psychopathy and sociopathy. So I, I'm with Kevin on this. I think she timed it, it knowing it'd give her a bigger boost. Yeah. But you know what we don't talk about enough? The fact that she went through that phase of dressing like Princess Di, <laughs> turned around and said, oh, I've got an eating disorder as well. Turned around and said, oh, the paparazzi are after me. I feared for my life. Even in that interview of Oprah did, the whole black eyeliner under her eyes, like when uh, Diana did her famous mm -hmm. interview. And I'm like, can you stop doing cosplay of your husband's mother? This is your Edipal husband's and weird. dead mother. Yeah, this very is weird. messed up. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the reason the analogy is being drawn between uh, Megan. Uh, Harry and well, because Wall Harry Wall made that connection. Yeah, but Wallace well, Simpson, it, Wallace he? Simpson and just like my mother e But Edward the Eighth was a very weak. <laughs> Edward the Eighth was a very weak man as well, who was completely mm. controlled by the far more domineering Wallace Simpson, uh, who was narcissistic, controlling, uh, and uh, uh, generally a slightly toxic presence. Uh, the reason uh, that it's such a, a, a kind of striking similarity is the fact Harry's quite clearly pretty weak as well, because he should say, no, no, I don't think you should do this on the day I'm honouring my mother, mm. albeit with... But instead, um, he meekly does mm. it and Harry's just lets her get... Harry's obsessed with her, isn't he? Yeah. So, I mean, the Oedipal complex is, is all on him, it isn't is, it? It is, yeah. It's and really it, odd. I absolutely agree. I, I really do think it is a kind of dependency thing where he actually doesn't feel... I, I, I don't think Harry himself is very well mentally, and I think that he... He has never really gotten over it. And again, we don't know them personally, and this is all speculation. Well, I think we can know from Spare that he's not well mentally, because well, that's all he talks about. And, and the, the you know the thing with the with the Cree, with his mother's Cree, oh, and, yeah, no, I just can't, yeah, can't even really imagine even. it. Just... But I, I do think it's really sad, and I think that he clearly feels dependent on Megan, and that is why he won't you know set those boundaries and say, no, today is about my relationship with my mother, my brother and I are going to be doing this for, for her legacy. And instead, instead of actually you know, setting those boundaries with her, he lets her do as she wishes and she kind of encompasses this sort of narcissistic persona in which everything is all about her. Yeah. It's all about mm -hmm. Megan and she's the victim, yeah. she's a victim uh, of the press, yeah. she's a victim of an eating disorder. And I do think it's yeah. incredibly sad. I think mm. Harry seems to feel dependent on as her. As you say it, Reem, what a shame that she just didn't remember it was Diana what the Diana Wars. She just didn't, it was an accident. Uh, anyway, uh, the other big story of the day, one of the big stories, if you ask me, is the Victorian Albert Museum here in London, which receives £67 million pounds of our money, government money, taxpayers' money, uh, has got an exhibit at the moment. It's kind of a Punch and Judy uh, sort of fairground attraction uh, where they've got three villains. One is uh, Osama bin Laden. The other is Albert... Uh, is Albert, is uh, 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 Adolf Hitler. And the other one is former British Prime Minister, voted back in four times, it's, Margaret Thatcher. It's uh, pathetic, It isn't is it? pathetic. So, pathetic. What's what wrong with... Well, well, A, it is very disgusting. I mean, you know, the other two are sort of famed for having murdered like gazillions of murderers. people. One is the most famous terrorist in the world and the other is the most famous horrible murderous dictator in the world. Mm -hmm. You might not agree with Margaret Thatcher's policies, but grow up. Yes, exactly. Grow up, you sad leftist. So, and also, she didn't kill anyone, I think, is, is the right. primary point here. Margaret Thatcher, I mean, like, Margaret Thatcher herself, whether you agree or disagree with her economic policies, I think she... I do agree with her economic policies. She saved this country. She I, did. I was there. She did. Uh, we are asking you, the viewers, let us know what you think. Uh, was Margaret Thatcher, as the Victorian Albert Museum maintained, a villain... Or was she the hero who saved this nation? Let us know what you think. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text us, right? Talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222. <laughs> or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. My thanks to my glamorous yeah, hello, Hi, yeah, I want to... Oh, sorry. To our top story now. <laughs> and the Tories are facing yet another leadership crisis with a group of right-wing backbenchers reportedly plotting to replace Rishi Sunak with Penny Mordaunt in a pact with the One Nation Tories. But the Prime Minister remains defiant, saying he will call a general election if any attempts are made to force him out of office. Uh, Sunak, Sunak has urged ministers to stick with the plan. What is the plan, by the way? <laughs> and in since the UK economy has turned a corner.
I'm not interested in all Westminster politics. It doesn't matter. What matters is the future of our country. And that's what I'm squarely focused on. That's what I get up every morning working as hard as I can to deliver, whether it's cutting people's taxes, increasing the state pension, today increasing the number of apprenticeships and talking to small businesses. Those are the other things that matter to people. And as we've seen over the last few weeks, our plan is working. Inflation is coming down. Wages are growing. The economy is back to growing again. And if we stick to this plan, I can deliver a brighter future for everyone in our country. Well, there he is in Warwickshire telling us all about the plan that is wow. so evidently a grand success story uh, that we're all cheering from the rooftops. Uh, joining us now is Harry Phibbs from Conservative Home. Hi, Harry. I mean, I suppose what is the most interesting about this story is we keep hearing of plots and, you know, strategies to change the leadership. It's the only way they might stand a chance in the next election, or as Donald Trump puts it, it could be a bloodbath. Um, but... What's interesting about this is this idea that it could unite both wings of the party, that he that she is in some way the unity candidate if the sort of mafia families of the ERG and the, the rest of them, the new Conservatives and the list goes on and on, uh, do a pact with the One Nation Conservatives, then, well, at least everyone in the party might be happy for a sweet five seconds. Yes, I don't, I don't take the story... Seriously, I don't say that the journalists have, have, have made uh, it up. I think that... Have the, we got Penny been, Morton some... saying that... Hello. Well, I mean, Penny, Penny Mordaunt is, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's the answer to the difficulty the Conservatives have got. If anything, she would uh, be rather rather more woke than um, Rishi Sunak. And, you know, we're saying, right, what is the plan? Let's, we need a, a, a clear Conservative plan, which I, which I agree with. But I don't think Penny Mordaunt would supply that. I don't think that she's got a, a clear policies uh, that would be in line with traditional Conservative beliefs of a smaller state and greater freedom and lower tax and lower spending, for example. Um, I mean, one uh, example we had today was uh, Rishi Sunak talking about uh, wanting to help uh, small businesses, and that's the traditional Conservative um, call. And there's something about reducing a bit of the, uh, the, the red tape, the regulations, but that's the kind of issue where the, where the Conservatives should be much bolder. We, we, we've now got the power to, 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 to be much bolder in terms of uh, Brexit, and we could raise a threshold from an awful lot of these regulations because for big companies they can absorb them for small companies they can't so he's he, he's right to focus on the importance of small firms but but in terms of having a strong clear conservative policy he needs to be he needs to be going much further so that's really what we need rather than uh, you know to, to messing around with yet another leader we need to get some proper conservative policies uh, pushed through i mean i can understand harry why people might want to replace uh... Rishi, in theory, uh, because, you know, frankly, he's been worse than useless. He hasn't achieved anything. F gave us five things that he was going to solve, didn't really solve any of them, particularly the boats. However, it's too late to do it again. To do it again would be to send in descend into the area of farce and comedy. Uh, but uh, the idea that Penny Mordaunt could be a replacement uh, proves just how desperate the Tories are. Penny Mordaunt uh, is another one of these people, if you look into her history, isn't really much of a Tory. Uh, let's uh, remind ourselves of her very, very strong conviction uh, that trans women are women, which, of course, they are not, but uh, not according to Penny. Let's have a listen to Penny. But let me say in proposing them from this dispatch box that trans men are men, trans women are women, and great care has been taken in the drafting of uh, and the accepting of these amendments. Uh, so, so there you are, Harry. I mean, this is just, she, she embraced uh, the woke devil, if you like. She wrote a whole book about it, how the Tories had to be far more woke, far more left-wing, etc., etc. So if you must have someone else, I suppose do it, although I'd say it's a mistake, mm. but not Penny Morden. As many people say, uh, she's pretty much an empty vessel. What has she ever said or done that will warrant her taking over from Rishi Sunak? And considering she thinks trans women are women, is she really a suitable leader for the Tory party? No, I don't think she is. And I think, actually, she's she's damaged her chances because I don't think there will be a leadership challenge. And she's, she's damaged her chances by engaging in this in this sort of political flirting, where uh, she'd be much, she would have been done much better to have expressed you know, um, loyalty to, to, to Rishi Sunak. As it is, because she's being silent on, on that, she's, uh, uh, you know, I, think, I think undermined her, 
of her future chances. But I mean, her, her views on the transgenderism are app appalling. And this is something where, where we, people are now recognising that this, the seriousness of the issue in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the, the harm being done to uh, children of the puberty blockers, the threat to um, women's rights in terms of women's safe spaces, the threat really to freedom of speech and, and, and people not being allowed to, allowed to state, state straightforward biological um, facts. So it's, it's, it's not a completely fringe uh, issue. And, and if, if she's taking such a, a terrible line on that, it, it, it does, of course, also mean that her wider political judgment is in question. So I think for that reason, I think it would be unlikely that even if there was a leadership challenge that she would um, emerge after the after the scrutiny of, of, of the sort you've just given us. Absolutely. Thanks, Harry. And, and, and well done for answering our question when uh, Kev so beautifully demonstrated the fact we don't have a cough button in radio. Well, we <laughs> There's plenty more, do no, 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 It's supposed to go quiet when we're interviewing <laughs> someone, so it's not my fault. It's great, Harry just answered it like a Anyway, question. Harry, well done. Thank you very much for carrying us through that broadcasting crisis. <laughs> Oh, we love live TV. Anyway, Reeve, I mean, it is interesting that, uh, you know, Penny Morden seems to be the person that all these, you know, plotters and backroom uh, uh, drivers, let's say, uh, are coalescing around. But I think, you know, if you ask the general public, they're just fed up that nothing sensible seems to have been done when the Conservative mm. Party's been in government for coming up to 15 years, that they can't sort of point to a thing that's been a success story, and that they change Prime Minister every five seconds and do all these plots rather than just focusing on policy. Well, Surely that's, that's what it. the public are feeling. This is it. It's about personality and it's about politics. And actually, what's interesting is a lot of uh, those those in the ride, the Andrea Jenkins, for example, said, "Yes, I think we should be changing changing leaders, but not Penny, Penny Morden, not somebody that's effectively a centrist. You're not necessarily going to be uh, super strong on policy. But also, I mean, this is most people are rightly saying this is absolutely absurd. Five prime ministers since 2019. No, it's not going to happen. It's also not going to increase your chances of winning an election. It's not going to soften." the blow. So I think it's really about getting your head down and getting those policies implemented. We saw Rwanda, the Rwanda amendments are back in the Commons today. So there's going to be some hope around that. Inflation statistics are coming out from the ONS on Wednesday. They're expected to be lower. So, you know, there, there are some things, there are some numbers that the government can throw around to show that there has been some success, although it is incredibly mediocre. I think the point of the matter is, this is personality politics. Harry makes an excellent point. I think that the fact that Penny has not come out and said, no, 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 this is not what's going to happen, it means that she comes across as a backstabber and we know that the party members don't like them. Yeah, well, Rishi Sunak is a backstabber, isn't he? Stabbed, oh, is he backstabbed? Stabbed like Horace's and back. She's backstabbed. I mean, that's yeah. the other person they're talking it's about like a bringing back. Backstabbing old circle. Greeno Lib Dem Boris. Yeah. I mean, they haven't got any proper he's conservatives. Not even yeah, it's oh, ridiculous. Well, well, hey, tell, tell that to David Did Cameron. Tell that to Lord <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't <laughs> seem to be much. <laughs> Just make him a lord, Lord <laughs> Boris. He'd love that, wouldn't he? Uh, let's move on. Uh, Nigel Farage, a proper conservative, you might say. Uh, you know, as I've said to you, uh, Alex, a few times, he should really get involved in helping reform out, but doesn't seem to be all that interested in that. Uh, but uh, maybe interested in what we're hearing is an offer from Donald Trump, should Donald Trump win the American presidential election, that Nigel Farage will become his sort of US envoy, his envoy to Britain and the EU over here uh, throughout the Trump administration. That's interesting. It is incredibly interesting. And I don't think it's true that Nigel isn't helping out reform at all. I mean, he's definitely. Well, what, maybe turn up to their party conference. But not publicly. Like and this is the point, right? So hang on, hang, when you say he's not helping them out, why didn't he go to their party conference? Well, I think. That, did, that didn't help them out very I much, think, did it? No, I think, I think these, are, these are political moves, aren't they? I mean, I mean yeah, uh, Alex, yeah. Alex, 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 is still keeping his avenues open. Yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, there, there have been rumours about him joining the Tory party. I don't think that's true. No. But I think that what is true is that Nigel himself is a very, very unique political character. Incredibly unique in that his relationship with the US, his relationship with Trump's campaign is incredibly strong. And actually, look, would this be the worst idea in the world if we are, get to, if we are to see Trump in the White House? Would it be the worst idea in the world to have somebody like Nigel uh, uh, coalescing with, with the British government? Mm. I, I'm not sure. Well, the fact of the matter is, I think it'd be a very good idea if he ended up being the ambassador, because the mm. last people we had, it was Sir Kim Darroch, who actively hated Trump, yeah. briefed against him, and look how that ended up. And then some 
woman took over that no one ever heard of. And I remember when I was an MEP going over there to try and explain the Northern Ireland Protocol to uh, governors and senators and the like. Um, and we were doing nothing in Britain. We had no functioning uh, high commission or uh, yeah. you know, embassy over there, as far as I could tell. But the thing is, you know, the, these appointments are made usually by the UK government, and they're not going to see the logical point of actually saying, About actually, he would be a good yeah. interlocutor. So it's probably not going to happen. But special envoy? Who well, knows? Who knows? Well, they're talking about maybe making him an American citizen so he becomes uh, the American ambassador to London. He could, yeah, he could be the American ambassador. He would have to be an American citizen to do that. Yeah. And again, I think that's, that's an interesting but idea. The special relationship... It would be funny. The special relationship... It would be so funny. Come on. <laughs> Go on, Nigel. I'd love some of that. <laughs> <laughs> He'd love that, wouldn't he? No, we, well, look, the special we relationship too. is so important. The relationship between the US and the UK, we are long-standing allies. And I think it's really important, especially in the wake of everything that's happening over in Eastern Europe and Ukraine, everything that's happening in the Middle East. Geopolitics at the moment is so strenuous and, and so, so shaky. It's really important that we develop that relationship with the US. Now, if Trump was to become president, win the presidential election this year, and we had somebody like Penny Morden to number 10, for goodness sake, <laughs> Yeah. Could you imagine how the, how strained the relationship really would be? I think it's important that we have somebody there to act as an in-between to really ensure that the relationship remains strong. Uh, one, one thing I find astonishing, actually, is, you know, he hasn't been elected for four years, my mm. mate Nige, and yet he seems to be the most wanted man at the moment, wanted by <laughs> Ofcom for offences against uh, partiality, apparently. Uh, but if you look at um, the, the, the front page of The Express, saying, oh, he's going to make this big political comeback to reform, this gets teased out uh, regularly. Uh, the Times, however, have done a, a, an article basically saying if he did, reform would overtake the, the Conservatives yeah. on polling, which is a, a super interesting prospect. I am sure to Nigel, but even though I know him very well, I can tell you one thing. He keeps his cards close to him, chest. So uh, watch this space. Also, uh, in fairness to Nigel, he's not involved in these Ofcom complaints against... Uh, no. Uh, what's he called, that other party? Well, they're saying yeah. another yeah. politician uh, hosts uh, the uh, show. GB and News, yeah. Oh, yeah that. Uh, old... So he's not involved in that, but... Uh, well, he's not an elected politician, yeah. but the ones yeah. that have been... I, I, th I think he's uh, pursuing interests in favour of the uh, Nigel Farage party at the moment. Oh, bless so, him. So, uh, anyway, let's uh, read some text, shall we? Well, yeah, we asked you, of course, about uh, Margaret Thatcher, and your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast. We said, uh, was Margaret Thatcher a villain or the hero who saved the nation? And we're asking this because a new exhibit at the v &A Museum had the audacity to place her beside Hitler and Bin Laden. Well, John says, she certainly had more backbone than the last few PMs, that's for sure. <laughs> Sean wrote in, she certainly did nothing for the north of England. And Peter writes, uh, she had what politicians are missing now, backbone, guts and intelligence. And Jane argues the Iron Lady was an absolute heroine. I agree. I agree too. <laughs> you know, I, 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 well, I remember in my teens or something, I went to my grandma's house and picked up a biography of Margaret Thatcher and it was so inspirational, just going, wow, this grocer's daughter who became PM and was one of the most sort mm -hmm. of uh, infamous Prime Ministers we ever had. I mean, I'm a big but fan. She's not, but why is but she infamous? She's well, not, I don't infinite. think she's infamous. She had, no, she, she had more backbone she, than any Prime Minister of the last 10 if years. And also, just fundamentally, this, this entire idea that she's a villain comes from this idea that she somehow, you know, is, is this capitalist uh, uh, I villain. I think it's wrong, but I think it's about the battle of ideas. And actually, people in this country seem to yeah. not like capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. And and how, can, how can but she be infamous? Lefties. lefties. How can well, she be infamous considering she won four elections? She was extremely popular. Anyway, we'll be discussing this further later. Oh, get our teeth into that one a bit more. <laughs> well, coming up after the break, though, after Kate is spotted shopping at her local farm shop, we're asking when will she finally decide to break her silence on that mystery illness? I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. 
is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist well, did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, uh, we're moving on to another of today's top stories now. That's the uh, <laughs> Princess of Wales. Yeah, allegedly, Kate was spotted at her favourite farm shop in Windsor on Saturday with onlookers saying she looked happy, relaxed, and healthy. It comes as royal sources suggest the future queen will reveal the full extent of her surgery when she returns to public duties, potentially as early as next month. And we're still joined by political commentator Reem Ibrahim. Uh, well, you know, this is quite clearly a staged appearance. You don't go to a Windsor farm shop without getting spotted if you're Kate, the Princess of Wales. So she goes there with the kids. This is an attempt to say, look, she's fine. Look, here's a picture of her with her kids. No pictures, though. No, but there's no pictures. Well, well, okay. <laughs> this is the point. There are no pictures, but there are apparently a couple of people that have told The Sun and another newspapers that, that they've seen her out at the farm shop. So clear, I mean, this is so clearly planted and staged. Mm. My question is, if they did this, then why were there no pictures taken? Yeah, I mean, I think there was an order basically saying, please don't take pictures, pictures respect her privacy. Do you know, I, uh, this morning, I had... <laughs> the I had um, always no, but this morning... Yeah. Windsor this, would have taken yeah, but this morning, done, yeah. I had paused to reflect on this whole situation after having a sort of boozy bunch of all my uh, girlfriends yesterday <laughs> and Kate being the main topic of conversation, as it often happens at boozy bunches. Um, but uh, this morning, I woke up looking like a hammerhead shark because I have quite severe atopy. My eczema can hugely flare up for no discerning reason. And my, literally, my eyelids swell up a lot like I've been in the boxing ring with Mike Tyson. And so I didn't do the 9.30 show this morning. I took a shed load of antihistamine, sat under a fan and thought, there's no way I'm putting this fizzog anywhere near a camera. And who knows what Kate is going through, whether she's taking steroids, whether she's taking, you know, if she's had some sort of transplant and needs other medical... We don't transplant? know. Transplant? Oh, that's one of the theories that was discussed well, at brunch. We don't know that, but, do No, nobody we? knows anything, right? And there might be, if you've had some very serious abdominal surgery, you'd imagine there's a sort of medical 
medical process that continues after that. And who knows what that medication is doing to that poor young woman. And if she wakes up in the morning looking anything like I looked this morning, then I, yeah, I don't blame her for mm. saying I don't want to show my face. Yeah, I mean, there was a really great piece in The Telegraph, I think by, by Camilla Tomley, basically talking about the, the way in which the media have sp uh, spoken about Kate over the last few weeks, the speculation around her health and also around her family, the, the whole saga with hashtag Photogate. And you know, all of the saga around that, there's a sort of drama around her health and the, and the kind of conspiracy theories that have been entirely fueled by it. Actually, if this is how we treat young women right. in the media, yeah. especially somebody that we all love and respect so much, like Kate, you know, uh, you know, wonder why they feel as though they have to hide when they're going through something uh, mm. serious. Exactly now. right. So, yeah. you, can't, you can't blame the media. The media are bound to speculate. Of course, they're and, bound, and the they're bound to fuel, pour petrol mm. uh, on, on the storm, as it were. Uh, and that's because, the, but in both the case of the King and Kate, I mean, you know, I hardly know what to say. It is good they gave us some information, as opposed to their past system, which was to give us Nothing, no information. Yeah. But the King did but, give more information. Yeah, than but Kate. what kind of cancer yeah. has he got? Then? Well, we don't know How what he's exactly. Kind of not really enough information. But this is the not point. enough information. Same for Kate. Not Sorry, but he has the right to privacy. The, the king has the right to privacy. Kate has the right to privacy. I'm sorry, really? but I think I'm it's unfair. For them. No, it's incredibly unfair to sit here and say that you need to be detailing every single list uh, of your, your medical history. We I need think more that's, information that's than wrong. they've given us, though. No, I think that's wrong. Think, excuse me, excuse me. I pay for them and they don't tell me anything about them. I think, you think that's a fair transaction? I, no, I think, I think what's fair to They, Kevin, they is should that they have are told people, us more. No, they are people and we respect them and we, we should be respecting their privacy. And I'm sorry. The fact that the media seem to think it's okay to hound Kate and, and, and indeed oh, why are they hounding Kate. her? No, how, all of this conspiracy theories, pulling the photograph. I think also, why don't they tell us more I think, information? Look, I think then actually, the I think the problem we have here. Are think... you going to sit here and detail every list about you and your oh, your medical history? No, 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 no. Nobody's pay, the taxpayers don't pay for me. We do pay for the royal family. We should know more about Charles, and we should know more about Kate. If we did, we wouldn't have this firestorm look, of conspiracy think... theories. You know, really giving Kate a hard time. It is the fact that Kensington Palace hasn't given us enough information about. But how do we know? It? It to the extent that she is now saying, I will tell you all about it, proving they haven't told us enough. It is the fact that Kensington Palace has so badly mishandled that, that this poor lady is at the centre of this think, media look, fire. I think it's worthwhile saying that it's the sign of our times as well. Um, when the, the, the late Queen's father uh, died, yeah. uh, nobody even knew he that had he was cancer. Ill. He had lung cancer. I don't think they'd even told him he had lung cancer. They didn't. They didn't. So it was a great shock, and that's the way business was con conducted. And I think if we didn't live in a modern digital world with social media and all the speculation and conspiracy mm. theory and this ability to take photographs instantly and upload them instantly mm. and track everyone everywhere they go and every second of the day, if we still lived in the sort of days of the pinhole camera mm -hmm. and, you know, a, a, and a black and white photo, then and all of this could be dealt with differently. Photos. And so it's very difficult. Kensington Palace is stuck between a rock and a hard place. I do think they've massively mismanaged this yeah, situation. Exactly. But I think it's fair to say, I think the media in, in the United Kingdom have been really quite respectful we of have. this situation. We the have. foreign well, media haven't. Social media, American media, all story. over the place. It, it's just. I, I do think that's a good point. I do think that, you know, publications themselves haven't been terrible. No. But I think the point is on social media, the horrendous. And I, and maybe, maybe, I should, maybe I should be blaming the media. Maybe I should be blaming. The, the, the horrible lefties on Twitter that seem to think it's OK to mm -hmm. plaster her photographs everywhere, speculate, arguing that she's had a hysterectomy or, or, or whatever it is. I think it's horrible. I think that for anybody yeah. it's horrible, but also... That's social she's media, in the isn't public it? Light. Yeah, social exactly. media's just a cesspit of horror. I mean, yeah. I pretty much stay we all off it, apart from Twitter. It, yeah. And my Twitter, my Twitter sort of... Uh, mantra is I'm a broadcaster. I put things out there. I'm afraid I don't read the comments because some are probably very nice, others less so. Yeah. I did reply to one comment this morning when I said oh, I can't you? make the 9.30 show and someone said, oh, you've got a hangover again, have you? <laughs> and I was like, no, actually, yes. I woke up with a giant <laughs> face. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, wish. I have. No, I woke up looking <laughs> like a horror story. So, um, yeah, look, they've got a, so, everybody's you know, got a right to privacy to an extent and, and the royals are, are the same as the next man apart from the fact there is a sort of obligation. They have to share some stuff with us because we mm. do pay for them and uh, quite clearly and I'm not demanding give us every detail of your life no 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 but quite clearly in the case of Kate and to a lesser extent the king they they've given us some information but not enough this system of 
dribs and drabs. You can have this, but you can't have that. Well, it's clearly not fair. good, no, it's not no, good I enough. I completely disagree. I think that's fair. I think that it's completely fair for her to say, I've had this surgery, but mm. actually I'm not going to detail every single... Uh, in, in, but she's in going to, detail. though, isn't she? Well, but then again, that's her choice. When she wants to, when she's ready, when she feels able to, and when she's able to do that publicly, when she is re-engaging with her public duties, mm. I think that's absolutely You're very fair. happy to just give them loads uh, of money and let them do it. Well, I mean, even, even no, no, so, no, the No, 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 we argument... call the shots with the royal family. They're trying to maintain their brand. We give them money. They owe us more information. Uh, look, I must admit on this one, I'm, I'm a little bit more with Reem, but that's because women you tend are, to be empathetic. <laughs> but, you're, uh, you're not journalists. I went to I Cardiff believe, Journalism I believe School, in the best in the I country. believe in Thank disclosure. You very much. I'm a journalist. I believe in disclosure, hey. not secrets. I've got my journalism qualifications. Well, Worked for BBC and like ITV. Right, like anyway, one. Uh, right, on that topic, journalists are also here to give you information, which is what I'm about to do, rather than just turn this into another shouting match. What we do know is that uh, there's a possibility that Kate might accompany her family to the Easter Sunday church service. That's uh, uh, in Windsor, uh, near her Adelaide cottage home. She might be seen doing that walk with her kids if she's up to it. Uh, we also have learned that King Charles could be driven in a carriage to Trooping the Colour rather than riding a horse as he would normally do um, as he continues his cancer treatment. So a lot of sort of loose ends might start to be woven back into the fabric of the narrative over coming weeks. We will just have to wait and see. Uh, well, we will, uh, but... Uh... You know, this whole situation is not very satisfactory, really. I hope Charles makes the tripping of the colour and I hope his uh, recovery continues apace and I hope I mean, it... Kate's <laughs> do, do so. We just, you just need to tell us a bit more it... so we know you're just recovering normally. I think it, it is, like I said, it's a reflection on how a royal family in the modern era, in 21st century, of digital media, speculation and conspiracy, yeah. conspiracy theories conducts themselves. The Queen somehow managed to have it down pat, didn't she? Um, yeah. But uh, I'm afraid we live in a very different era now. <laughs> in this country obsessed with privacy it's overrated trust me that's what that's <laughs> uh, coming up after the break kevin reveals all about his wild youth and what he got I up to at the mind weekend if you want to hear it and after that <laughs> why donald trump is predicting a bloodbath if he fails to win the upcoming u.s election i'm alex phillips and i'm kevin private o'sullivan and <laughs> you are with talk tv on tv on radio online and on your smart speaker Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read a statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. <laughs> and I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, time for a look at some of today's other big stories. Uh, we'll start with the claims that the BBC bias uh, is still in operation, especially regarding the war in Gaza. You're pulling my leg, aren't you, Kevin? I am. What? I'm the going BBC out on a limb. I'm telling you that the Gaza. state broadcaster is a bit no, biased. It didn't. Uh, political commentator Reem Ibrahim is still with us. This concerns a couple of their Middle Eastern reporters uh, who've been found to be liking uh, tweets. Uh, that like Hamas, that's calling them freedom fighters and supporting what they did on October the 7th. These are supposed to be impartial BBC reporters. We've seen this before. Uh, as I said earlier, that, you know, if the BBC wants to employ local people to do their jobs in places like Gaza, fine, it. that's up to mm -hmm. them. I think it's a bit strange, to be honest with you. It's not racist to say that the best way to cover a foreign country is send your own people yes. so they can interpret it for us back here. So we saw earlier in the Gaza war, we saw one of their reporters, a Palestinian guy, sobbing as he gave us the news about more Palestinians being killed. I sympathise with his heartbreak. I sympathise with the situation. But it's a bit odd that you've got a BBC reporter in the middle of this mm -hmm. uh, conflict sobbing about mm. the deaths of one side, the Palestinians. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all a question of BBC bias in general. And I do think that this is in... And I, I dare I use the word institutional issue within the BBC. Mm -hmm. We see this... I mean, if you've ever met a... Um, <laughs> I'm going to say something I might regret. I've even met some of those BBC journalists who sort of work uh, across across the world. Some of them can be a little bit... Well, they are incredibly left-wing. If you ever talk to them about... Uh, I had one particular story in a, in a, in a bar in, uh, abroad where we met a BBC journalist who was covering, I think, in Egypt. And, you know, he started talking about Israel and was honestly ready to start a fight. Uh, he just you know, absolutely no, no sort of looking at, at the bias, no looking at the language that you're using. And this all comes from the top, where after... October 7th, the BBC took so long to actually call Hamas a terrorist organisation mm. in the first instance. So the fact that this kind of weakness is coming and stemming from the top of the BBC filters all the way down and these yeah. people feel like yeah. they can get away with it. I think Absolutely. what's interesting is, you know, the BBC here are regulated very much by rules of impartiality, uh, but that is not the case for most other broadcasters in other countries, particularly the developing world. And if the BBC are going to have all these various arms, and we had a show before where we found out quite how problematic BBC Arabic actually is when yeah. it comes to sort of yeah. uh, dodgy reporting and, um, uh, and, and anti-Semitism. I've always been a big advocate for the BBC World Service because having lived in various countries around the world, the I think impact. it's sort of a good yeah. diplomatic arm of this country, but it has Soft to be done yeah. properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, my fear is when it comes to things like BBC Arabic, that really is not happening. And then what happens is that gets read by lots of people around the world in a digital age. And then, you know, what is, what is the representation then of Britain? Yeah, I've got to say, I... I, I I, I really sympathise with that view. I've, I've sort of changed my view on the BBC over the last few years. I do think, though, I would have no issue with the BBC being incredibly left-wing or even, you know, having this kind of bias when they're covering stories if the taxpayer weren't forced to pay for them. Mm. The fact of the matter is, if you want to watch Talk TV or any other mm. broadcaster, you have to be paying for the BBC. And I think that that's wrong, and I think it's effectively an, an additional tax. Let's call it what it is. 
And I think that actually I wouldn't have an issue with BBC bias because you know we are all biased. I think it's somewhat uh, inescapable. But I would have no issue with that if we weren't forced to pay for it. We've, mm. we've seen stories of grandmas in the, in the UK being hounded right. by authorities, and I think it's horrendous. I mean, one thing I, one thing I would say about the various different uh, BBC foreign language stations is if you ever need cheering up on a rainy day in the United Kingdom, then just log on to BBC Pidgin, P-I-D-G-I-N, which is the hybrid sort of English Nigerian language that you get across West Africa. Log on to BBC Pidgin and read the news in BBC Pidgin because it's uh, certainly a more cheerful. Valid language. Oh, There's a tone, a tone that we don't quite get here in the UK. Valid language, <laughs> valid language. Now let's talk about uh, um, uh, the uh, Rwanda scheme, shall we? Uh, what is going on there? Uh, tell us all about well, well, all the amendments. You're always good so... on all of this. Uh, you know, not feeling very well, so hit us. No, well, by hitting yeah, it. You do it. Oh, but, but, but this is like the sort of, you know, the wing, Look, of, uh, the wing of talk to me. It deals with sickness today. What I'm is Ill. wrong with us? Honestly, we'll be like being carried out in gurneys by the end of the week. I'm in such a bad mood. I'm not feeling very well. Right, but anyway. So, right, so it's emerged today. So we're going to see if essentially the government's uh, Rwanda scheme, it, the bill, is passed this week, yet another Rwanda bill to try and get those planes off the ground. But Rwanda's basically said they need a staggered start to the migrants' deportations. Uh, with the first flights not taking off until mid-May at the earliest, government officials have said it will take a minimum of six weeks to get flights off the ground uh, from the point at which the safety of Rwanda bill receives royal assent. So that's where we're at now. The parliament's got to decide that Rwanda's a safe country, and that happens in theory. In theory, that's going to prevent uh, immigration lawyers, the ECHR, and every other cohort of uh, in interfering petty foggers to prevent the Rwanda uh, plan from taking place. I think, frankly, what's going to happen is a plane might be allowed to take off, but it'll have, like, one sad person yeah. on it who hasn't got a legal representative. Yeah, that's probably right. And I think what's interesting about this is that the bill hasn't received royal assent yet. It's just come, come in from, uh, to the Commons from the Lords after receiving those amendments. So, it, you know, we're, we're still actually not even at the stage where this is law yet. Mm. And I think what's interesting is the Rwandan government saying, OK, you know, we're going to need some time. This is coming at the same time as the government's new scheme for people to voluntarily choose to go to Rwanda. So these are separate things where actually you're going to be forcibly deported if you are, if your asylum application is rejected and you're still in this country, you can be forcibly uh, deported to Rwanda. But if you choose not to go to your safe country and you would actually prefer to go to Rwanda, you can voluntarily <laughs> choose to do so. So it's all crazy. By the way, if you do that, you also get three grand of the taxpayers' money. So I think it's really interesting the way in which this is all being played out. I think it's primarily political. Now, we spoke earlier about the issues with Sunak and the sort of uh, rumours that Penny Morden wants to take over and all of this ousting. Actually, what Sunak really wants is a photograph of migrants getting on on that plane. Do you know what? I want to know if the scheme's open to me because most days I wake up, look at the weather, look at the news and think, yeah, take me back to East Africa. It's a great part of the I'd world. Get yeah, by the way, if you, yeah. if, you don't yeah. like, if you don't like it and you want to come back, just make your way back to Calais and you get a free dinghy <laughs> all the way back and then halfway across the RNLI lifeboat will pick you up and bring right. you into Dover food. and then you get a four-star hotel. hotel. Free yeah. food, free money. It's a great system. Great, great scheme. Why don't you try that? Now, Grant Shapps is out and about. Uh, this is why we have <laughs> these senior politicians uh, warning us that Putin has stolen this election in Russia. Are you telling us, Grant, that this election wasn't upstanding? Are you saying <laughs> that the Russian election was somehow corrupt? You must be joking. <laughs> Why is Chaps even bothering to tell us that obviously Putin stole this ridiculous election? And what's, so what's interesting about this, when I was at university, we were studying um, competitive authoritarian elections. That Actually, often in these authoritarian governments, this happens in Russia, it also happens in a country that I'm from, in Egypt, where effectively these authoritarian regimes will allow competition in the elections, but the, uh, the election result will be stolen. So they often do allow a soft or moderate form of opposition to, mm. to oppose themselves and actually so that the election looks to other countries as though it is a real election. But they're not fooling anybody. We all know that they've stolen this election. Mm. Just the fact that we have Grant Shapps coming out and saying, well, this is why you know both parties need to go into the election and promise 3% of GDP for defence. Yes, OK, fine, that's true. But how can you use this argument?
argument to, to make to make that point. We all know that Putin. We all know who Putin is. We all know exactly what kind of an authoritarian zealot he is, mm. and we also all know the threat that he poses to the rest of Europe and to the West. And so I think it's really important that we have those conversations without mishmashing the way in which elections well, have been done. Talking talking about somebody who the legacy mainstream media would say uh, was also posing a threat to the West and was an authoritarian monster. Yeah. Should we have a little listen to what Donald Trump said, which is the basically Donald. broken the internet? If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now, we're going to put a 100% tariff on every single car that comes across the line. And you're not going to be able to sell those guys if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. It's very clear to me that what he's talking about there is very much an economic bloodbath. But every single other broadcaster out there seems to be saying, even the BBC, oh, he's calling on violence, oh, he's saying that people are going to murder each other, isn't this dreadful? What is wrong with these people? Well, I do I do think that Trump needs to be much more careful with the language he uses. I also think this has probably been intentional. He knows that he's going to make the airwaves, he's going to go all across uh, X and, and other social media platforms, and people are going to be listening to this. Now, I'm I am not a huge Trump fan. I really don't like him as a person. I think that he lied about, you know, ste about uh, Biden stealing the election. And I do think he is particularly dangerous to democracy. But my God, he is a good orator. And he is excellent at getting people to really feel angry about current geopolitical situations. I, I would just don't say... do think his policies him... make sense? His policies yeah. make sense uh, in terms of broken America. Biden's make, n make no well, sense a, I mean, whatsoever. You know, I care primarily about economics being from the Institute of Economic Affairs. He's he's a protectionist. He would subsidise American farming to, so that it doesn't have to compete that's with okay, other farmers. I mean, no, I think that's wrong. It's, it's anti-free trade. It means that consumers don't have... No, but it's, per, but it's America first. No, but this is the point. You he doesn't say, care about... He can, America first. And, and, then, and then consumers... You don't agree with no, him, but that's his policy. Well, then economically, consumers in America have to pay more, yeah, but, more expensive American products when they could be importing it more cheaply. And, that's the point. I think, economically speaking, Trump is not on my side, at least. But I think that, you know, what we're talking about here is a geopolitical situation and at least compared to Biden he seems to have a stronger uh, position on Putin. And well, compared to Biden he's just stronger all round because yes. he's not falling downstairs and forgetting his own name. <laughs> so you Super know that's a, and He's got yeah, plans that's a... to maybe just shore up that southern border so millions don't come across oh, no. causing a humanitarian catastrophe. People are dying down there. Oh, it ridiculous. is such America a mess. America so. is in a mess. So. Uh, Right, Trump's on that the answer. Note, <laughs> Trump is... Well, we're not supposed to take a side, are we? Are uh, we? Who I, knows? I'm not, well, we've had I'm balance, not haven't we? <laughs> We're balancing it. I think this is the BBC. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> piggy in the middle and I'm not going to say anything. Thank you, though, Thanks, Reem, Reem. Thank Thank for being you, here Reem. and saying a lot. We've really enjoyed Great your fun, company, Thank as you very much. always. Now, coming up after the break, yet more Tory chaos as Sunak faces another challenge to his leadership. And we're going to be taking your calls on whether Margaret Thatcher was a hero or a villain. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from era. that. era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Cross Talk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I am Alex Phillips and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Coming up in the second half of the show, Rishi's election threat. The Prime Minister tells rebel MPs he'd rather call an election than face a leadership campaign. Meanwhile, is Kate about to open up? Reports suggest the Princess of Wales could discuss her health with well-wishers very soon. And the V&A is under fire as a new exhibit places Margaret Thatcher alongside Hitler and Osama Bin Laden. Yep, you heard that right. Couldn't make it up, <laughs> could you? All that coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Elliot Gotkin. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak has dismissed speculation of a plot to replace him to avoid a general election disaster, insisting his party is united. Sources say Conservative MPs are considering replacing him with Penny Mordaunt if Sunak is unable to turn around the Tories' opinion poll deficit. The Prime Minister said the speculation doesn't matter. I'm not interested in all Westminster politics. It doesn't matter. What matters is the future of our country. And that's what I'm squarely focused on. That's what I get up every morning working as hard as I can to deliver, whether it's cutting people's taxes, increasing the state pension, today increasing the number of apprenticeships and talking to small businesses. Those are the other things that matter to people. Vladimir Putin has claimed a landslide win in Russia's election, extending his rule for, as president for another six years. Early results last night claimed the leader, who has ruled for nearly a quarter of a century, won nearly 88 per cent of the vote. However, no credible opposition candidate was allowed to stand. Putin hailed his win as an indication of trust and hope in him. Former National Security Advisor Lord Kim Darroch told Talk TV it's about how Putin is seen on the world stage. And of course, we are all saying in the West it was a sham election, as it was. What happened to Navalny shows what happens if you're a serious opponent of Vladimir Putin. But in the rest of the world, they may see things, see things a little differently. And what it means he can do is he can go on the international stage and say, first of all, I have complete support from the Russian population, or near complete support. Second, this was an endorsement of what I am doing in Ukraine. Media regulator Ofcom has found GB News broke broadcasting rules in five programmes hosted by serving Tory MPs. They involve episodes from Sir Jacob Rees-Mogg's show and a programme fronted by Esther McVeigh and Philip Davies. Under Ofcom rules, politicians aren't usually allowed to host news programmes. However, they are allowed to present current affairs shows. 
Detectives have marked the 15th anniversary of the disappearance of university chef Claudia Lawrence with a plea for those with information to come forward. The 35-year-old was reported missing after she failed to turn up for work at York University in March 2009. Her disappearance has been treated as a murder and the case has become one of the best-known unsolved crimes of the past 20 years. Britain's most successful female Olympian, Dame Laura Kenny, has announced her retirement from cycling. The 31-year-old won five Olympic golds and seven world championships. She gave birth to her second son last July and now won't compete at this year's Paris Olympics. And street artist Banksy's new artwork in North London has been getting plenty of attention. The work, which appeared overnight, shows a massive green painted behind a cut-back tree to look like foliage and has a stencil of a person holding a pressure hose next to it. That's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's a sunny afternoon for the vast majority of the UK and largely dry and mild as well. But there are some showers spreading eastwards, mainly across eastern parts of the UK for this afternoon. And before the end of the day, wet and windy weather will be heading towards parts of Northern Ireland and western parts of Britain. But in between all of that, for most of Scotland, England and Wales, it's sunny, it's mainly dry, bar the showers in the east, and it's feeling warm. Warm for the time of year, where temperature highs are locally up to 17 to 18 degrees Celsius, the average for the this time of the year is around 11. Now, overnight, we'll continue to see that rain across uh, Northern Ireland spread towards parts of Scotland, Northern and Western England and Wales. It will be windy with it as well and there'll be more wet weather heading across Northern Ireland through the night as well. But it looks like for eastern and southeastern parts of England, it will just about stay dry and everywhere will have a mild night with temperatures holding up in double figures. So tomorrow, once again, it will stay mild, but it's going to be a bit of a wetter day, especially across England and Wales. We'll see spells of rain turning into showers spreading southeast Eastwards, but skies will brighten across many areas. So in the sunshine and the southerly winds, it's still going to be another mild day. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, including the new royal biography, which compares Meghan Markle to Wallace Simpson and criticism of how the BBC handles Agatha Christie adaptations. Uh, should we talk about Donald Trump Let's again? Let's talk about uh, the Donald, Aubrey because Allegretti it got is quite excitable in the last hour. And I thought, apart from waking up tomorrow, you know, partially sighted yeah. and deaf, um, you know, let, let, let's give that one a go again, because I think Aubrey's going to be a quieter offering in this debate. It's always a still small voice of calm. Uh, <laughs> so is an easy one for you. Do you think Trump will win the election? I mean, nobody sort of expected him to in 2016. And, uh, you know, if I suppose if this is a rerun of 2020, then people will ask, you know, how much better has Joe Biden been? And obviously economic growth in America has been much more successful than it has been in the UK. Uh, Joe Biden has done a much better job at sort of reducing uh, inflation and keeping it much tamer than we've seen in other countries across the world. But the question is really, do people sort of feel about feel that in their pockets enough to, to ultimately sort of stick with him? And that's got to be a big motivating, mobilising factor. They might just sort of stay at home or end up going for Trump and saying, well, we'll just sort of, you know, take turns switching between the two parties. What, what I want to ask you as a journalist covering politics is, um, you know, I've been not shocked or surprised, frankly, but, you know, yet again, quite disappointed that when you watch Trump's speech and he uses the word bloodbath, to me, it's very clear he's talking about an economic bloodbath. And it's a strident term, yes, but it's not incitement to violence. I can tell that. I'm no idiot. I think most people aren't idiots. Similarly, I think he sort of made a mention of a, a crime that was committed by a, a, an illegal migrant to the country and called him an animal or something to that end, of which now, you know, that means he's clearly Racist. labouring all people who cross the border animals. And it just, it, you know, every single media outlet seems to have doubled down on the use of language rather than talking about the interesting facts of the story. I wanted to know your reaction to that. And if you think it's just sort of getting overbaked nonsense, this sort of deliberately decontextualising and becoming overly sensitised to the use of particular words. Well, Donald Trump is somebody who is fairly sort of carefree with his language. So I think to a certain extent, people will sort of take this with a pinch of salt. But I suppose there is the undercurrent to this, which is 
the extent to which there is a concern that if he doesn't win the election in 2024, as he didn't in 2020, what that means. And we saw a fairly violent uprising on January the 6th at the Capitol building. And I suppose there's a concern that this is a sort of call to arms, yeah. indicating that the same thing or worse could or should happen again. Now, Donald Trump makes clear that he was talking about an economic bloodbath relating to effectively the automotive industry. He was saying, I think there should be 100% tariffs on cars that are being imported to the US. So he was saying, if you vote for me, great news. If not, then the automotive sector will be decimated and there'll be this economic bloodbath. But do we really not expect our politicians to understand the impact of their words, particularly in the context say, of January 6th? Do we not expect our journalists to also understand the impact of words and actually talk about the story and talk about whether this is a good policy instead of every single broadcaster, other than us, of course, going up in arms and screeching about, oh, he said bloodbath, he's a threat to stability. I mean, actually, to me, it's the irresponsibility of journalists who turn What's this into the about, big though? stirring what, pot. What is this about? This is the. This is not. Maybe not even the beginning. Certainly, uh, the uh, the start, shall we say, of the Democrats' campaign and that campaign. Uh, Biden's campaign will be, uh, my opponent is a lunatic, my opponent did January the 6th, watch out, he'll do it again. Look, he's talking about bloodbaths, as you yeah. quite rightly say. <laughs> Trump's it campaign, was quite he clear. died in 2002. It, but but, <laughs> but certainly that. Trump should be careful about using words like bloodbath because Biden will jump on that. That's what we're talking about. This is going to be the Democrats' com campaign. Do you want us, uh, the Democrats, who've uh, you know restored some kind of economic prosperity to America? America, or do you want that lunatic? That will be their campaign, right? Yeah, I suspect that Joe Biden will effectively uh, sort of present Donald Trump as somebody who's deranged, potentially sort of untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. Obviously, yeah. he did do the job as US president for four years. But um, Joe Biden really set out on a mission to make politics boring again. And people will decide whether or not that's something that they ultimately prefer or not. He's, he hasn't been boring. He's been very entertaining. I think <laughs> he's been unusual, I think, <laughs> as a president. To say yeah, the can least. say that again. Now, talking about uh, big figures in politics, we've been asking today, after uh, the VA have done an exhibition essentially putting uh, Margaret Thatcher alongside Osama bin Laden and um, Adolf Hitler, in fact, was Margaret Thatcher a villain? or a hero who saved the nation. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. We patch through to the studio and chinwag with us live on air. You can text us 8722 if you're being a little bit more coy, like talk before your message, or tweet us at Talk TV. Uh, and we've got lots of texts uh, and messages coming through and indeed phone calls as well. And Shirley is on the phone from East Sussex right now. Uh, welcome to the show, Shirley. Hey, uh, Shirley. What would you like to say? Thank you very much. I love your programme. Thank you. Um, I absolutely agree with Kevin that putting Margaret Thatcher on the same level as those two killers, great killers of this century, of the last century, is an abomination and should be they should be ashamed of themselves. VNA should should know that uh, they don't put those sort of people together in the way they have. Do you think they should actually rethink the exhibition and remove it then? Absolutely, yes, I do. I haven't been there recently and I'd quite like to go, but... I think I'd throw a few mud pies at them if they didn't do that. I'll come with you, Shirley. Now, don't <laughs> take this wrong, uh, uh, but uh, I'm assuming you were around during the Thatcher years, so you you will remember this. This yes, is absolutely. what uh, the people at the VNA do not seem to understand. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was incredibly popular yes. and she was voted back four times by the British electorate. So this idea that she was a universally hated villain is just nonsense that, frankly, kids today, they assume that's what she was, what that's what she is. But she wasn't. She was very popular, wasn't she, Shirley? Yes, yeah, she was, except for those in the North at times. Um, but, and also, she stuck up for this country because not only did she have guts and intelligence, she was patriotic. And how many of the current um, we, ones that we've had since Tony Blair and so on have been as patriotic? Would she have tolerated the uh, influx of all the immigrants? And not for a second. No. no, I totally agree with you there, Shirley. She was a conviction Prime Minister, the likes yeah. of which we have not seen for a very long time. Where are you in East Sussex, Shirley? Hove. Oh, lovely. My, 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 my brother lives in Eastbourne and I'm a regular visitor to your part of the world and I absolutely lovely. love it. So when you come to the V&A with Kev, can I come and house it for you? Absolutely. We'll, we'll come down your house, Shirley. We'll look at all the boats coming across from Calais. How's that? <laughs> look forward to that. Great call. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, let's get back to our top story now. Uh, Rishi Sunak has said he will call a general election 
only if any attempt is made to remove him as Tory party leader. It's been revealed uh, that a number of right-wing MPs are touting Penny Morden to take over Sunak's position in a pact with One Nation Tories. Well, this comes as polls show the Conservatives are heading for their worst defeat in the party's history, with Labour on course to win a majority of nearly 250 seats. But Sunak remains defiant, urging ministers to stick with the plan. Say it carefully. Well, the, the plan. What, what, is, plan? The what plan? is the plan? What is the plan? And insisting the UK economy has turned a corner. Well, joining us now is The Times chief political correspondent, Aubrey Allegretti. I mean, look, it's every five seconds with the Conservative Party. They can't help themselves. Is it? We need a plot. We need a new leader. We've got to get a new leader for the next election. First, it's Kemi Badenoch. Now it's Penny Morden. One point a few, about a year ago is Richard, Rishi Sunak himself was going to be this new leader to save the day. Before that, it was Liz Truss. Uh, then it was Boris Johnson who actually did save the day. I mean, none of this is going to work, is it? Because it's exactly this chopping and changing and politicking and parlour games instead of policy making that the public are really peeved at. Did you I, like my alliteration? I, I, I you. did. You're very good at it. And you're absolutely right as well, I think. What do you think, Aubrey? Yeah, if there's one thing that um, almost all Conservative MPs can agree on, it's that disunited parties don't win elections. Mm -hmm. The problem is they sort of all seem to think that they are the ones who are correct and... You know, the other people are the ones who don't f quite fully understand. There is something in the Penny Morden sort of rumours doing the rounds. Uh, I think it was sort of cooked up by some former government advisers who have been kind of working very vehemently to try and oust the Prime Minister. This is the sort of latest iteration of their plan to drip feed stories to, uh, to sort of try and dislodge him. But there are some MPs that I spoke to on the right who genuinely have sympathy with this. I suppose the question is about the practicability of it. So, first mm -hmm. of all, does Penny Morden want it enough to start calling for Rishi Sunak to go? I think she does. She's not denying it, is yeah. she? Well, she's not, she's she she not pouring does. too much scorn on these alleged yeah. plans. And, and time is against her because she is one of the potential future leadership contenders who has a seat which is more marginal. So others can afford to wait until after the general election and sort of bide their time, potentially take over as leader, probably, of the opposition. She's... Whereas she is in the position of having to sort of go sooner if she really wants it. So there is that that comes into play. Then there's the question of exactly the timing. So May the 2nd is the local elections. We also know now it's one of the only dates Rishi Sunak has ruled out for not <laughs> holding the general election. But that's kind of the moment of greatest vulnerability for him because there are expected to be big Tory losses. There'll be the seats that were up for grabs in 2021, which were at the sort of height of the COVID vaccine rollout. Boris Johnson unlocking, so, you know, giving us all of our sort of responsibilities back. There was a big rally around the flag effects and the Conservative Party was still doing very well in the polls up until that point. So the losses potentially could be quite catastrophic. Yeah, so also Penny Morden, the, the, these right-wing MPs, she's not their woman because she's not very right-wing. She's rather woke, uh, as we highlighted earlier, uh, made that uh, now notorious speech in the Commons uh, saying that uh, trans women are women. Now, I thought you weren't supposed to lie in that chamber. Uh, that is a lie. Uh, trans women are trans women. They're not women. But that sort of statement uh, where she where she uh, pinned her colours to the mast, uh, that's why she's not the right-wingers candidate at all. But while you're here, Aubrey, you can help us out because Alex and I have been scratching our heads. We keep hearing it. Rish is going to stick with the plan. <laughs> He's the, the, the plan. The plan. If you look at read the newspapers, there, uh, Rishi Sunak is uh, absolutely uh, committed to sticking with the Tories' plan. The plan. The plan. The plan. And we're going. What is, what the, is plan? the plan? What is it? Well, yeah. If you're wondering it, the voters probably are <laughs> as well. Um, so, sort of, we had a speech from the Prime Minister today, which you know only turned out to be about seven minutes long, and we were expecting it to potentially be his sort of first full speech of the year, setting out a big kind of vision but we haven't really had that so far. So the Conservatives are essentially boiling their plan down to a series of economic interventions and saying that they want to abolish national insurance, but admitting that that is likely to take place over 15 years or so, and also pinning their hopes quite a lot on the Rwanda plan sort of becoming operationalised. We should get ping-pong, i.e. the bill going between the Commons and the Lords today. So it's hoped, maybe, it, by those in government, that the flights can take off in about six weeks' time. Just in time for the local elections, that would probably suit number 10 very well. Mm. But beyond that, where is the sort of vision and what is the optimism for the manifesto that Conservatives want? Because it doesn't shall seem we, to be Shall we warm seen. our cockles on this Monday morning by listening to the Prime Minister's optimistic plan that he was telling the nation about uh, early on today from Warwickshire? 
I'm not interested in all Westminster politics. It doesn't matter. What matters is the future of our country. And that's what I'm squarely focused on. That's what I get up every morning working as hard as I can to deliver, whether it's cutting people's taxes, increasing the state pension, today increasing the number of apprenticeships and talking to small businesses. Those are the other things that matter to people. And as we've seen over the last few weeks, our plan is working. Inflation is coming down. Wages are growing. The economy is back to growing again. And and if we stick to this plan, I can deliver a brighter future for everyone in our country. Still going on about his plan. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm, bringing I'm focused on bringing down people's taxes. What well, is an idea, Rishi. Why don't you actually <laughs> do that instead of just headroom, saying Kev. it? It's all about the headroom, don't you forget. Oh, I mean, really, why doesn't he cut taxes if he wants to cut taxes? Well, should, should we talk about, uh, when it comes to headroom, let's uh, talk about a headache, uh, which is uh, whether Nigel Farage will come back and uh, lead reform, as the speculation on the front page of the Daily Express seems to suggest. Then there's another competing story saying, oh, no, forget that. He's going to be the special envoy to the United States to make the best of the Trump administration. Where would you see him best? Uh... It slightly depends on the timing of the, of the election again, because Donald Trump, uh, sorry, Nigel Farage has made no sort of surprises out of the fact that he is really supporting Donald Trump and he wants to go over to the US to sort of uh, fly the flag for him. So if the election ends up being held in the UK within a matter of weeks of the US election, then there's probably a limited amount that Nigel Farage can or wants to do in the UK to influence the, the contest here. So I suspect Rishi Sunak sort of keeping that one under his hat to try and hope that Farage is stateside instead but of over here. This is the problem, isn't it? Because it is, it will be, in, well, this is sort of suggesting that Trump could make him a special envoy to the UK and give him American citizenship. But certainly if it's going to be a UK appointment, that would come from the government and the next government is unlikely to be the Conservative par Party. So it makes it a bit difficult for Rishi to strategically offer him a role to get him out the way. But um, your wonderful newspaper, I think, has reported that if he did come back and lead reform, uh, that the instant boost to public polling could see the party overtake the Conservatives? Certainly, I think what we've seen from Rishi Sunak is that he lacks the sort of um, oomph and the communication skills to be able to cut through with voters yeah. that Boris Johnson sort of had, you know, bountifully in 2019. And somebody like Nigel Farage has that as well. So there's concern amongst the Conservatives that somebody like Nigel Farage could kind of swan in, get a lot of attention and airtime. Obviously, he's not an elected politician in the UK anymore. And he is the honorary president of reform, but he doesn't sort of seem to be, you know, taking too much of a front and centre role. If that changes, then I suspect the Conservatives would be terrified because there'd be that pincer move. I think, ironically, it'll be the domino effect here, and what he decides to do might well be decided by Ofcom at the end of the day. I think he's OK, but uh, I've just got this kind of uh, vision of... Uh, OK, put the case, uh, Starmer's won the election, and he's sitting around with David Lammy and the gang, and they're going, this guy Trump, what on earth is he saying? Oh, my God. Donald, uh, then in comes Nigel Farage. Excuse me, I speak Trump. Perhaps I can help you translate. <laughs> that kind of, I think, is the role that Trump has in mind, that he will be... Uh, that Farage will be his ears and eyes here in the confusing and difficult continent of Europe. That would present, I suppose, a real challenge for the Labour Party because they have been previously very critical of Donald Trump when he was president. And Theresa May sort of found this to her detriment. Even there were Conservative MPs who were really uncomfortable about the time it sometimes took her to call things out when Trump said things that, you know, in the US didn't seem quite so kind of radical, whereas in the UK the country as a whole is certainly not sort of as to the right. So a Keir Starmer-led government would certainly have lots of calls from Labour MPs really suggesting that he should push back very hard on Trump, and that presents huge difficulties for the special relationship. Mm. It certainly does. Yeah, maybe they do need uh, young Nigel as the perfect interlocutor in that situation. I think, uh, seriously, uh, given that Labour probably will be our next government, and let's put the case that uh, Trump's got a pretty good chance of winning the uh, presidential election, somebody like uh, uh, Nigel Farage moving between the two, this mm. Labour government and Trump, he could fulfil a very useful purpose. I would have suggested. Well, when was the last time one of the legacy part parties did anything commonsensical, Kev? Yeah, well, somebody, <laughs> yeah, somebody actually suggested, that was my old friend Andy Coulson wrote in the uh, Evening Standard last week, that if uh, Keir Starmer it really is committed to a cabinet of all the talents, we don't necessarily need politicians in it, why doesn't he keep uh, David Cameron as foreign secretary? 
Well, that would be a novel idea, but I suspect that David Lammy would have other ideas. Yeah, uh, yeah. So. <laughs> I think Keir Starmer might as well, but uh, Do you, know what? you never I, know. <laughs> I, I find myself shocked that I'm going to say this, but I think I'd rather have David Lammy, who I'm no big fan of, uh, rather than uh, Lord Spadeface of Xi Ping Norton, frankly. I don't trust that, <laughs> I as agree far with as I can you. I agree with you. Anyway, Aubrey, thank you ever so much. Always delightful Thanks, to Aubrey. have you join us in the studio. Now, coming up after the break, the royal biography, which claims Meghan really is as narcissistic and controlling as fellow American Wallace Simpson. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, here's a shock for you all. A royal biographer has described Meghan Markle as narcissistic and controlling. You don't say. Uh, comparing her to Wallace Simpson, the wife of the Duke of Windsor, who famously abdicated from the throne after marrying the divorcee. Well, in her new book, author Sally Bedell-Smith, one of the royal family's authorised biographers, claims that Meghan Markle is yet another domineering American woman who has come between two royal brothers. She also brands Harry 
a weak man. Well, joining us now is our favourite royal commentator, <laughs> Mr. Michael Cole. Hi, I'm Michael. How are you doing? <laughs> we had a... Alex, it's so nice to see you both. Oh, yeah, it's always you too, Michael. Always a pleasure. You. We had a very lively conversation at the start of uh, uh, this programme about Meghan Markle and whether she was a narcissist or not. And I basically said, well, look, I don't know her personally. I don't want to sound like a social justice warrior, Me Too movement leftist. But I don't really think that I can say that, as I don't have any personal relationship with her, that I can have an opinion on this other than empirical evidence, where she basically uprooted a man from his family home, moved him aboard, made him do a big sit-down interview of one of the biggest talk show hosts in America, slagging off his family, and seems to do every single launch relating to Meghan Markle, or, you know, at a perfectly chosen moment to interrupt whatever the royals' plans are. Hmm. I think it's um, I think it's a little unfair to uh, compare Meghan of Montecito with the Belle of Baltimore because uh, Wallace Simpson was the unwitting cause of the great abdication crisis of 1936. But after that, uh, she was very, very discreet. She never issued uh, a public statement or said a public word of criticism of the royal family. Indeed, when the Duke was declining, uh, she welcomed Prince Charles and Princess Anne, and then the Queen and the Duke of e Edinburgh came. There she is with the, the Duke uh, in happier times, and she welcomed uh, the royal family to her house in the Bois de Boulogne, which I visited about 30 times in my life. And uh, she, when she died in May 1986, the RAF flew her back to Britain, quite an honour, uh, she had a, a, a funeral service at St. George's Chapel and she was interred next to the Duke in Frogmore, the royal burial ground, which, of course, is very close by Frogmore Cottage, from which Meghan and Harry uh, did their moonlight flit with their, uh, uh, with their son Archie clutched to their breasts and flew off on a scheduled flight to Canada to begin their self-imposed exile eventually in California. So I think it's a bit of a tough comparison by Sally Bedell Smith uh, with, between the two women, because I think they were completely different. Uh, and actually, uh, Wallace Simpson, who didn't look to become queen, that was the Duke's intention. Of course, it was refused by Stanley Baldwin, the prime minister of the day. Uh, and, but after that, uh, she did, conducted herself perfectly, perfectly properly. Uh, and was, as I say, invited when the Duke uh, died in 1971. She stayed at Buckingham Palace. I don't think that's going to happen with uh, Meghan Markle anytime soon. Uh, absolutely. But I think uh, the other tenet, if you like, of this comparison is the men. Uh, so uh, Edward VIII has always been depicted as a rather weak man who certainly was enthralled to Wallace Simpson. Uh, people remember he basically skipped to her beat. Whatever she wanted, he did. So she was in control of that marriage. And I think what people are suggesting is the dynamics of the marriage between Harry and Meghan are pretty much the same. And uh, you do kind of get that feeling. I was thinking when you and I, or when we spoke last week, Michael, yeah. about the way she sort of hijacked the day of the Diana Awards to announce... Uh, the launch of her new uh, lifestyle website. Harry, uh, only later that day, had to go onto a Zoom, live Zoom, and make a speech to the Diana Awards in London. Uh, William had been there live earlier on. And you would have thought that Harry might have said to Meghan, not today, Meghan, do it a different day. This is the wrong day to do it. I suspect he might have said that, but was immediately told to shut up. That's basically the way I think it goes. And don't forget, remember Harry's famous uh, statement, what Meghan wants, Meghan gets. And that's certainly yeah. the case with him. It's this, this comparison, I think, is more to do with weak men than powerful women. I think you said it out perfectly. Uh, it is true that the Duke uh, of Windsor and I know this from talking to Sidney Johnson, his ballot for many, many years. He was obsessed uh, with the Duchess of Windsor, Wallace, uh, until his dying day. Uh, she would have been quite content to have remained uh, his mistress. In fact, she actually loved quite deeply her second husband, Ernest Simpson, and they remained friends throughout their life. It was the Duke who was pushing on and, and had to have this woman. He gave her up. He gave up the throne, he gave up the empire, he gave it up for the woman he loved, as he said in his memorable 
uh, statement of of abdication. He couldn't carry on doing the job without the woman he loved. Uh, in America, where they're rather blunt about these things, they're certainly saying that um, Meghan wears the trousers in Montecito and the Duke of Sussex um, bends to her will. I think when we've seen it in action, when you watch that Oprah Winfrey interview, which was quite clearly her initiative with her friend Oprah, yeah. he looked there and to my eye, he looked extremely embarrassed and uncomfortable about being there, particularly when she strayed into the toxic area of, of racism and the allegation that uh, people within the royal family had uh, raised questions about the tone of the skin tone of their then unborn child who uh, was born uh, and is Prince Archie. Um, all of that he looked uncomfortable with. So is he being led by the nose? Uh, we'd have to be, I think, within the compound to know exactly what goes on. But I think it's a reasonable supposition uh, that she certainly gets what she wants. She's certainly uh, laying out the um, parameters. She's uh, making her game plan. And who knows what it is? Uh, certainly Wallace Simpson didn't have any uh, great plans for herself as a, as a, as a member of the royal family. Uh, and she didn't have uh, po political plans. And apparently uh, Meghan does have political yeah. plans mm. and she has other, other purposes. Indeed. Well, I'd say she'd make a good politician because most politicians are slightly narcissistic. And I'm no psychologist, right? <clears throat> but if I was going to give it a stab, I would suggest that if a narcissist wanted to set up a business, it would be something called American Riviera Orchard, where they have such a high opinion of themselves, <laughs> they think the rest of the world should want to emulate their lives and buy their beige tat. So, that's my you know sort of... They're jam. Alex, They're jam. You know, it, it's, it's, often, it's often said that politics is, is show business for ugly people. Yeah. Perhaps Meghan's going to try and make politics politics for beautiful people. Yeah, she you certainly know. is. She right, obviously but... sees herself in that role. Let's, let's ask you about this. Uh, there's another story this morning on the front page of The Sun saying Kate has been seen out and about for the first time. Well, it's not strictly true. There's no picture of no. her, but apparently she went to the, Win the local Windsor farm shop with the kids, looked happy and healthy and beaming and smiling. Uh, you sort of suspect this is another sort of publicity device by Kensington Palace to uh, drip feed us with information that makes it look as if her recovery is full steam ahead. Uh, so we've had that, we've had these pictures, the pictures of her and William in the car, the picture of her and her mum, Carol Middleton, in the car. Uh, why don't they just get... Since it's quite clear that Kate is up and about now, why don't they just get her to address the camera and say, listen, everyone, I'm absolutely fine. As I told you, uh, I'll be around after Easter. As I always told you, it would take a while. Please stop with all this nonsense about me being dead or my love life or whatever. Just leave me alone and I'll be back with you in a couple of weeks. Wouldn't that cure a multitude of sins? I honestly could not agree with you more. I've actually written something exactly to that point uh, a few minutes ago and sent it off to uh, a newspaper. Um, it is absolutely true. This, these pictures or this trip to the local farm shop, all to the good, shows she's ambulatory, she's out and about, she's making progress. But the only way to scotch these absurd, vile, foolhardy, mad rumours and speculation uh, is to actually make a statement. It's no good briefing uh, individual reporters that she'll say something in an informal situation with members of the public after she returns to public life. That will not stem this avalanche, this uh, tsunami, if you will, of ill will that is swilling around uh, on, on the uh, in social media. Uh, a simple statement, because uh, as she has said herself, uh, there's tremendous goodwill towards her. Uh, people love her. They want to know more about her. They will be un not just understanding, they'll be supportive. And if she has a chronic condition or any sort of condition, making, us, making it known, even in general terms, will, I think, do good. It will help people to sympathise, it will make people understand, and it will wish her well. And I think that can only be a good thing, particularly uh, as she gets back to full uh, public life and uh, a proper uh, health uh, within her family while she's bringing up three lively young children. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't understand why she doesn't just do some sort of five-minute Zoom appearance with one of her charities, like Kids Play or something. You know, we don't have to see anything other than the sort of... Uh, headshots, do we? But it does make me wonder if maybe she's having some sort of treatment which affects the way she looks, or affects her face. That's something I can certainly sympathise with oh, as yeah. someone who woke up looking like a hammerhead shark this morning. Um, <laughs> but... Alex, uh, Alex, what you're saying sounds too much like uh, common sense for Kensington yeah. Palace because, my goodness, they have dropped the ball on this. Uh, those highly paid PR professionals who've been brought in by Prince William to KP, they shouldn't have allowed the uh, phony uh, photograph fiasco to happen. Good staff work would have prevented that. They now have the opportunity to put things right. And actually, a simple bulletin, if she's not up to making a statement, a simple bulletin, putting it in simple terms, uh, we don't have to know every detail, but we should be allowed to know which way things are going, because that is the only way to stop the stupid speculation, mm. which is damaging. It's damaging, it's damaging. Uh, to the royal family and it's damaging to, to public life they, in this they country. Still, Michael, they still, Michael, they still seem to see the way out of this is to do it in whispers and in winks. They're oh, letting the yeah. press know fairly soon she will go and meet the public somewhere and she will talk to someone on mic about her condition and then you'll find out a bit more about it. How circuitous, how ridiculous. Mm. Just make a statement to us. It would, it would kill all this nonsense stone dead. So let's hope they uh, do see some common sense fairly soon. But good to get more of your common sense, as always, always. Michael. Thank you so much. Michael Cole there. Next, the v &A Museum in London is under fire as it's placed Margaret Thatcher alongside Adolf Hitler and Osama bin Laden in a new exhibition. The former Prime Minister is described as a contemporary villain and shown as a spitting image puppet. The decision to include Baroness Thatcher in the exhibition has caused outrage and led some to discuss some of the achievements of Britain's first female Prime Minister. And let's remind ourselves of one of her greatest hits at the Conservative Party conference in 1980. Thatcher famously laid out her political style, telling critics, for those waiting with bated breath for that favoured media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The lady is not for turning. I'd have liked it more if you actually tried to do the voice as well. Oh, okay. Go on. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do it. Come on. You turn if you want to. The lady is not for turning. How's that? That's not too shabby, actually. It's not yeah. too bad, you I can, suppose. You can do a good drag act. Well, we're going to have to talk to someone now who will remember her voice very well. Um, uh, he was important to her, trust me. He's political columnist and former political editor of The Sun, Trevor Kavanagh. Trevor, great to have you on board because you will be able to explain, as I've been trained to explain, because we're men of a certain age, that, you know, she was re-elected four times. This modern generation said, oh, everybody hated Thatcher, she was a villain, look at that, right up there with Adolf Hitler. She was not. Mm. She was wildly popular, was she not? She was, and just for a moment there, Kevin, I thought that she was back here with us. There you go. Um, <laughs> Marvellous impression. Um, look, I was one of the... I'm one of the few surviving people who actually were at her side through the eight years that I covered uh, politics with Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister from 83 until she departed. Uh, I travelled the world uh, with her in the uh, RAF VIP jet, which took her to every major capital in the world. And uh, I, I also remember vividly the sort of praise and adulation she received, not just from her allies, but from those who were not necessarily well disposed to her, not least the Russians who christened her the Iron Lady. And when she went to Moscow in the 1980s to open the very first McDonald's in the Soviet Union, as it was then, she was absolutely mobbed in uh, Moscow. And when she went to places like as what was then known as Kiev, uh, she was mobbed again. Uh, Francois Mitron famously uh, had a crush on her and described her as having uh, the eyes of Caligula and the lips of Marilyn Monroe. And uh, I think that once I was in, when I was in Paris once, uh, someone said to me, a, a senior politician over there, when you, when you finish with Margaret Thatcher, can we have her over here? <laughs> I mean, these were the sort of tributes that were paid to her. And also, I mean, the thing is that um, intelligent Labour and left-wing 
um, uh, politicians at the time were also in awe of her. Uh, Dennis Skinner, the famous beast of Bolsover, the, the truculent lefty in the House of Commons, was absolutely obsessed with her and full of admiration for her robustness and the, de the decisive way that she carried through government. Yeah, one thing that, I mean, I adore Margaret Thatcher. I, I mean, I was alive during uh, her time in office. She snatched my school milk, but I forgave her for it. Um, but I remember as a, a, a teenager picking up a biography of Thatcher from my grandma's bookshelf and reading it and just going, wow, that is inspirational. And what I don't understand is I think she is still potentially an extremely inspirational figure to women out there in the world thinking, I can do what Thatcher did. Now, we live in a country now that we've had two female prime ministers. Uh, I wouldn't say either of them were a patch on Thatcher. But um, it is still, I think, very important to raise up uh, historical women like this and show the world that you, know, you can be female, you can be right wing, you can actually be assertive and not be called a monster or demon. So why is it that the usually very woke left want to keep doing that? Uh, it's very difficult to know. It's actually really for what is basically an academic institution, the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, this is bovine stupidity and amazing ignorance about the history of Britain. Um, if you have the time, if you haven't already read it, try the three-volume biography of Margaret Thatcher by Charles Moore. It's not just a, an interesting read. It's a riveting, almost like a novel, turning the pages of some of the mo most momentous periods in our recent history. And it is worth saying that those left-wingers who are whinging now about her are the beneficiaries of the economy inherited from the Tories by Tony Blair and Gordon Brown in 1997, which is on train as uh, the, the most rapidly growing, prosperous, we were one of the most prosperous nations in the world at that time. And look what they did with it. And just uh, before you go, Trevor, uh, try to sum that up, because what she really achieved was she took us out of the stranglehold of the unions, which were literally wrecking the country. I feel very sorry for uh, particularly the miners who all lost their jobs, but the coal industry at that point was unviable. It was economically suicidal. She had to do that. She had to break the stranglehold of the unions, and that's what she did. And she spotted things like, uh, you know, Docklands in London. She got that developed. She, she turned us from a 1970s-style union-gripped, wrecked country into a massive modern economic powerhouse and set the uh, seal for the future, didn't she? She did. She performed all the decision-making activities that the Labour governments that preceded her had ducked in a craven way. And it was not because she was spiteful towards the trade unions. It was because of the way the trade unions, the leaders of the trade unions, were abusing the power that they held. And they were holding the country to ransom at the time. So what she did was to take the difficult decisions, uh, bring the union leaders to heel. And in the end, she was the one who provided the background for what turned out to be a jobs miracle. I mean, more jobs were created in and after the Thatcher years than had ever been created before. And I, I think that the, uh, the, 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 it was the Russians that branded her the Iron Lady because of her decisive and consistent uh, patriotism for Britain, which we lack so much today. And I just wonder sometimes how she would have behaved if she'd become prime minister now instead of, say, Penny Mordaunt or some of the other candidates jostling for the position right now. Um, if, if we could only resurrect The her, country would maybe. be saved, I'll yeah, tell it you. Would, it would. Trevor, fantastic Thanks, to Beth. talk to you as always. Thank you. Now on the phone is Matt. He's calling from Cheshire, and he thinks Maggie was a hero. Hi there, Matt. Hi, good afternoon. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to uh, venture that, you know, you're sort of outside of your box when it comes to Northerners who like Margaret Thatcher. Explain to me what it is about her that you make defines her a hero. Um, I mean, contrary to what? people like Terry Christian and the Labour Party would tell you. <laughs> there are many in the North, the North East and the North West, who respect and admired Thatcher, and there's probably still are, to be honest with you. Now we've seen what the country is like in different hands. Uh, she was a political colossus, uh, respected by Reagan and Soviet leaders, and... Um, 
basically, she's got more... Well, she had more cojones than Sunak, Starmer and Ed Davey put together. Mm. Say that again, mate. I tell you, really, that those two shouldn't be mentioned... Those three shouldn't be mentioned in the same sentence as Margaret no. Thatcher. I mean, I'll cut Blair some slack. He, he was a colossal political achiever as well uh, in the direction that I don't like. But <laughs> he, was, he was a very successful politician. I admire him for that, and I admire Margaret Thatcher for the same reason. Whether or not you liked Margaret Thatcher, whether or not you liked what she stood for, uh, she saved she this country done. and she got things things done yeah. and she knew what she uh, believed. So uh, those were the days, eh? Uh, thanks for calling, mate. We've got to move on, though. Uh, thank you for a great call. Yeah, you know, my dad's from Durham and he worked down the mines in his ute and he loves Margaret Thatcher. So there you go. There you Put go. that yeah. on your pipe and smoke it, yeah. v &A. <laughs> Now, coming up after the break, The Sun's Ali Ross tells us why he's predicting the death of TV, TV comedy as we know it. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm hilarious Kevin O'Sullivan. <laughs> and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. the death of television comedy. Not well, again? You, not if you, not if you <laughs> got to see what just happened during the advert break, where these two... That's right, that's an advert right. Break. Tell everyone we're amateurish, that's but that right. Their they thinking, didn't have to know that, but you had to tell them. TV. Go on, anyway. Anyway, that happens to be the doomsday prediction of one critic after it was announced that the iconic and irreverent comedy series Curb Your Enthusiasm will end next month. The Sun's Ali Ross says television will stop being funny the day Curb goes off air. Uh, the show 
are now in its 12th season. 12th season, eh? Stars Seinfeld co-creator Larry David as a parody of himself, constantly annoyed by social conventions, rules and everyday occurrences, including a cut-off tie for the breakfast menu at his golf course. See, there's a cop salad on the menu, right? Right. Yeah, there are eggs in the cop salad. Correct. OK, so take the eggs from the cop salad, take the bacon from the cop salad, and put it on some toast. Yeah, I see what you're trying to do there. You're, you're looking for a breakfast loophole. It's not going to work. And you're not the first person to try. I'm not the first person time? to try the breakfast loophole. It was five easy nice. pieces, remember, with Jack yes, Nicholson? Yes, yes, yes. Hey, do me a favor, will you just ask? I can ask. Thank I will. You. And as long as you're asking, I brought my own this eggs. Uh, joining us now is uh, the Suns TV critic Ali Ross. Uh, yeah, that's a uh, Braemar Country Club. I used to live in Los Angeles. I played there. Uh, also, <laughs> also, I can tell you, I can Do reveal. You bring your own I can reveal. I can reveal that the very last episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm after 12 seasons will happen on April the 8th. And as you said, sadly, after Larry, there is nothing. Uh, why is this guy the last person who can deliver decent comedy? Uh, and why won't anyone else do it? What's the secret of his success? Well, it's, it's our old friend, political correctness, woke culture, which has strangled the life out of everything. Now, Larry David, before he was Larry David and Curb, co-wrote Seinfeld. So he, he's worth something like $500 million. He's an extremely rich man. So he can afford to take chances. Now, in an awful lot of comedy now, you are one joke away from losing your career. Everything. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's such a stranglehold it has on the culture. There's only people like Ricky Gervais and Larry David who have that money in the bank. Uh, Dave Chappelle was the other guy I cited who can actually go out there and tell the truth. And simply by telling the truth, you can be funny these days. Yeah, Say yeah. what is unacceptable. The script writing as well just seems to have become a bit mediocre. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the show Frasier because to me it's got a bit of everything. It's got the sort of slapstick element, the mm. timing, the lovable characters, uh, but also it's got utterly brilliant scripting. Mm. Yeah, and the remarkable thing about Curb there is a lot of it is improvised. Not scripted. They, they, they come in with an idea and just throw them that idea. Mm. And the cast are so brilliant. They're some of the best actors in Hollywood. They're queuing up to do cameos and curb your enthusiasm because they know how brilliant that is. What do you think the worst stuff is on the box today in terms of British uh, comedy? I have a healthy contempt for something like The Last Leg, which thinks it's dangerous out there pushing the boundaries. It is safely left And it wing, is the it? epitome of the comedy mm. establishment. It never has anything funny or dangerous. You mm. know what they think. You know what joke's coming. And Trump there's... and Brexit. Trump, Trump bre horrible Brexit, well, the Tories, bad. Yeah. yeah, it's so, so predictable. Mm. You could write it in do, your sleep. Do you know what uh, a proper TV channel should do right now? You or, and I could write, write the damn thing. They should be taking the mickey out of wokery. It is right there to be done. This madness. People that is are just, begging But they're for terrified it. Of, they're terrified Absolutely of. begging for it to happen. The first channel that does it well will clean up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, blimey, I'm up for that. I'll be part of that if you like. It's a bit like, well, there you go, you're on. Like hey. uh, Ricky Gervais, who dared to sort of take on the trans lobby's opinions just by stating a few obvious things like, you know, I don't know, Men if you've got a penis, women. it's pretty unlikely you're a woman, yeah. etc. And they go, how dare you say this? The thing is, if, if you've got you, a penis, you you're not going to be a woman, are you? People, mm. the, the classic bullies, they back down. They yeah. can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. If it's done as well as Curb, which approaches all these subjects, or Dave Chappelle, or yeah. Ricky Gervais, yeah. you will win. Yeah. yeah. No, I take it's you... There, it's there for, for someone to push back, back against this tyranny because everyone is sick, fed up of it. Well, Kevin, well, I try every day, Well, as I, we? as I stare into this uncertain future, perhaps I'll write a sitcom about wokery. <laughs> Could be an idea, something hey. to do, maybe, I don't know. I'm sure Larry David was based Ali on Ross, uh, great to see you, as always. Uh, sadly, though, Alex and Ali will come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. Up next is Ian Collins. Have a very good afternoon, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.
A very good morning. It's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> just 